Okay, we're going live in three, two, one. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope everyone's well. Um, and welcome to our first talk of the term. Um, so before we start, I have a couple of messages from the sponsors, which I need to give you. Um, so our, our first sponsor is BitBio. Founded by Dr. Mark Cotter and Florian Schuster, BitBio is an award-winning human synthetic biology enterprise. Their mission is to code cells for health. To do so, they apply the principles of computation to biology. Their current focus is to develop a scalable technology platform capable of producing consistent batches of every human cell. We'd also like to thank another sponsor, CRISPR, CRISPR Biotech Engineering, an early stage genome medicine company using CRISPR-Cas9 to develop immunogenomics-based therapies, as well as providing educational resources. Today, we're honored to have Professor Ed Boyden as our speaker. He's a professor of brain and cognitive sciences at MIT, the Y. Eva Tan Professor in Neurotechnology at the McGovern Institute for Brain Research and a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. He leads the Synthetic, synthetic Neurobiology Group, where, which develops tools for analyzing and repairing complex biological systems such as the brain and applies them systematically to reveal ground truth principles of biological function and to repair these systems. Amongst other recognitions, he has received the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences, the BBVA Foundation Frontiers of Knowledge Award, and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, this talk will be recorded. Um, it will be live on YouTube. So please feel free to send your questions through on the YouTube chat or in the Zoom chat. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Ed. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. <clears throat> so I direct a group at MIT that works on ways to analyze and repair complex biological systems. Um, we have a internal focus in the brain, but uh, as you'll see, the tools we develop are in use throughout biology to look at cancers, parasites, microbiomes, the immune system, and the list goes on and on. Why have such a group? Well, biological systems are large scale objects made out of tiny building blocks. And they evolve over years and decades, but their high speed signals are very brief. So we need tools that can cross space and time that can confront head on these challenges. So today I'll tell you three short stories about tools we've been developing to help people cross space and time. The first story is about space. How can we see the molecules throughout cells the cells throughout a tissue. Whether you're mapping a cancer or understanding the immune system or trying to find the circuitry of the brain, this is an important problem. Nanoimaging has been around for a while, super resolution microscopes, electron microscopes, but the technologies are expensive and slow and hard to use. So in our group, we wondered, what if we do something different? People have used lenses for 300 years to magnify images. What if we magnify objects rather than images? Can we chemically synthesize a dense mesh of swellable polymer, like the stuff in baby diapers, throughout a biological specimen? Anchor key biomolecules to the specimen, soften it, and add water, and blow it up. We call this expansion microscopy. In 1980, the Tanaka lab published a paper exploring the physics of swellable polymers. Take sodium polyacrylate, the active ingredient in baby diapers. When you add water, the polymer threads swell apart and you get these very fast thousand fold volumetric increases. How do you get the polymer inside? Well, in 1981, Christine Dreyer and Peter Hausen published a paper on chemically synthesizing using free radical polymerization, polyacrylamide hydrogels throughout biological specimens. They showed that they could use this method to facilitate staining and imaging. So it's fun to think, maybe the story I'm telling you today could have been done a half century ago. Our goal is to turn a cell like the one on the left to a constellation of biomolecules hovering in space like the one on the right. Two molecules that are touching are some minimum distance apart and two molecules that are some distance apart are scaled up by a linear factor. To make this work, we invented several chemicals and chemistries. First, we have to atta attach handles or anchors to all the biomolecules. In this cartoon, proteins are shown in brown, the handles are shown in purple. We now have handles for DNA, RNA, proteins, and are working on handles for other biomolecules. 
Next, we make that dense spider web like mesh of polymer. We use a strategy very similar to what Christine and Peter published almost 50 years ago. We bring in monomers, shown here as little white spheres, and they self assemble into polymers. When a polymer encounters a handle, encounters a handle it forms a bond. Next, we soften the specimen with detergents, heat, or enzymes. And finally, we add water. The water swells the baby diaper polymer. But this time, because of the handles, the biomolecules will be pulled apart. Panel B shows a piece of the mouse brain. Panel C is the same piece of mouse brain expanded 100 times in volume, about four and a half times in each direction. The polymer starts out very dense, like in the upper left, and it ends up swollen, like in the lower left. This first paper was done by Fei Chen and Paul Tilburg in my group. The expansion is pretty precise. The distortions are very small. We can measure the distortion. It's only a few percent over a microscope's field of view. Good enough for the vast majority of biological questions. We can compare what we see to the ground truth known from classical nanoimaging methods. Here you can see some microtubules being stained with antibodies bearing fluorophores. We know what microtubules should look like. We take our image and deconvolve by the ground truth, and we can estimate the resolution. A four and a half fold expansion would make a 300 nanometer resolution microscope have an effective resolution of 300 divided by four and a half, about 65 nanometers. And that's what we find. The left panels are zooming in to a piece of the brain from top to bottom, color code on the left. The right panels are the same fields of view after expansion. We can see much more detail after we expand. In fact, if we look at synapses, the distance between pre and postsynaptic protein densities are the same as measured by storm microscopy by Zhao Wei Zhuang and Catherine Dulac. Working with Eric Betzig, Ray Gao, Shoasano, and Goku Pagliula showed that we could immunostain against mitochondrial and lysosomal proteins in the upper right, myelin in the bottom, and do nanoimaging at very high speeds using a microscope optimized for expansion. So you can image an expanded object on a regular old microscope. That regular old microscope now becomes a nanoimaging device, but there are also specialized microscopes that can take advantage of the expanded state. You can express fluorescent proteins in brain cells and expand them to see the wiring of the brain. The top middle shows the expression of fluorescent proteins in different cells, but it's blurry because the resolution of a microscope is limited. The upper right is the same in field of view as the upper middle, but after expansion. Now we can see the fine wiring of the brain. What I showed you so far is about proteins, but you can also expand and label RNA. Oswasi and Fei Chen work together to expand proteins and RNAs away from each other, and then to label both of them. Here we can see the purple dots are individual RNAs being imaged with nano precision in intact brain circuits. In work spearheaded by Shahar Long, Dan Goodwin, Anu Sinna, Oswasi, and Fei Chen, we showed that we could expand and do multiplex RNA imaging. Bring in a hybridization probe, shown in purple, amplify it, and then we can sequence a little barcode found on the probe. This can be done for dozens of genes at once in a tissue specimen. In the upper left, we did in situ sequencing of these barcodes for about a couple dozen different cell type specifying genes. The upper left is the clustering, the upper right shows the cell type specifying genes uh, color coding neurons across the visual cortex, layer one on the right, layer six on the left. So now we can see the location and gene expression of cells. The nanoimaging capabilities of expansion also let us pinpoint where these genes are expressed with nanoscale precision in intact brain circuitry. Here we use data from Aaron Schumann and others to pinpoint where individual RNAs are expressed in dendrites and spines of neurons. 
as you can see, many genes are expressed in nano compartments of cells. We can look at other things than brains. Here with Aviv Rega, we looked at a breast cancer metastasis to the liver from a human cancer patient. We found that we could figure out how cells are organized in 3D space. Certain immune cells cluster, for example. If a certain immune cell is near a tumor cell, it upregulates its gene expression of a specific gene, S100A8. In the lower right, when a tumor cell is near a fibroblast, it vastly upregulates a gene that encodes a hypoxia-related factor. So we can map out gene expression in 3D with nanoprecision throughout tumor biopsies. By the way, we can sequence not just RNA, but also DNA. In a companion paper, Andrew Payne, Zach Chang, and Paul Reginato, working with my group, Jason Bonrosser's group, and Fei Chen's group, showed that we could do in situ genome sequencing as well. So now we can see not just gene sequences in the nucleus, but how the genome is organized. When J.B. Chang was a postdoc in the group, we showed we could iteratively expand. Take a specimen, polymerize and expand it, form a second polymer in the space opened up by the first expansion and expand it again. That lets you get very good magnification. The Blina Sarkar, Jinyan Kang and Oswasi, with great help from Margaret Schroeder and also Muchi Emanari and Christina Kitko have built important versions of this technique, made a version that uses all off-the-shelf chemicals. This has an additional benefit. It decrowds or separates proteins from each other, so we get better labeling. In the top row of the cartoon, antibodies can only get to the outside of a protein cluster. But in the bottom row, after you separate proteins from each other, you can easily stain for proteins in the middle of a protein complex. That allows us to look at synapses with great precision. For example, in panels B, C, and D are proteins that are hidden. They're in clusters, so protein uh, antibody stains cannot access them. Yellow is pre-expansion staining and purple is post-expansion staining. And yes, there's not much yellow. But after you expand, um, you can see much more in the magenta. Not all proteins are crowded. In F, G, and H, the yellow and purple look more similar. Amyloid plaques, for example, are thought to be involved with Alzheimer's disease. They're very densely packed. If we expand them, we get better labeling. Yellow is pre-expansion staining and magenta is post-expansion staining of these Alzheimer's model mice. In fact, we even see these tiny amyloid dots as shown at the bottom. This is true for multiple separate antibodies and we did not see them in wild type mice. We can also develop better polymers. One thing we're working on right now is tetrahedral hydrogels that form diamond-like lattices. Ray Gao and Jay Yu in our group showed that we could potentially expand much more precisely with such a hydrogel than with the earlier methods, getting single digit nanometer accuracy on a conventional microscope. You can apply this not just to brains, but all sorts of other tissue types. In work done by Yang Xin Zhao and Octavia Bikur, we showed that we could expand human prostate, lung, breast, pancreas. On the left, normal, and on the right cancer containing and get better resolution. Expansion microscopy is in very widespread use. Almost 250 experimental preprints and papers have come out. It's being applied to the microbiome, the kidney, plant seeds, mapping where viruses are, the list goes on and on. And really easy step-by-step -step cookbook, cookbook style protocols are on our website, expansionmicroscopy.org. Here are some examples of how much explanation we get about the protocols, how to handle cover slip, how to handle the gel expanded samples. We really want to democratize nano imaging. So in summary, the first part of the talk, we've discovered that we can physically magnify objects. This lets you do nano imaging on regular microscopes. It can be applied to look at RNAs, proteins, and other kinds of biomolecules. And the precision is extremely good. Finally, the protocols are very easy to use and use all off the shelf chemicals. So please give it a try. After all, biology is fundamentally about nanoscale building blocks and how they interact. Seeing them is very important.
Now, the limit of expansion on crosscopy, of course, is you cannot do it on a living thing. So the next part of the talk, I want to transition to the imaging and control of living objects. Let's start with optogenetics, a way of controlling brain activity with light. This started when Carl Dysroff and I were both students at Stanford. We went through all the laws of physics, trying to figure out how you could control neural activity precisely. We thought light would be the best because you could aim it at cells. You could bring light into the brain with an optical fiber, for example. But how do you convert light into electrical energy? Well, it turns out all over the tree of life, you can find microbial molecules that convert light to electrical signals. In the lower left, a light-driven proton pump is found in single-celled microbes that live in salty water. Shine light, and it'll pump protons across the membrane. The cell then uses that proton gradient to drive ATP production. This was found in the 1970s, and around the same time, a few years later, scientists found light-driven chloride pumps. Finally, around the turn of the century, people found light-driven ion channels in different microbes. Flash forward to the current day. We now know that all these molecules have representatives that are safe enough, fast enough, and efficacious enough to mediate neural activity control. Brian Chow and Xue Han found that there were certain light-driven proton pumps we could express in neurons, shine yellow or green light, and the neurons would then pump protons out there by silencing them. Amazingly, although these proteins require a vitamin A relative, all transretinal to work, mammalian neurons seem to make enough of it just by sheer dumb luck. Xue and Amy Chuang found light-driven chloride pumps that were safe and fast and effective enough to go into neurons, also to mediate their silencing. And light-driven ion channels can be expressed in neurons to mediate their neural activation. The first paper Carl Dysroff and I collaborated on, and later Nathan Klepeke, Orshamesh, and Yonku Cho and others worked to perfect them. This tool set of optogenetics, opto for light and genetics because it's genetically encoded, is very widespread in neuroscience. It's being used by thousands of scientists to activate brain cells and figure out what they can do, or to turn brain cells off and figure out why they're needed. I wanted to mention this just briefly because it's in very widespread use, and I wanted to tell you about some newer things we're doing. But let me just summarize by saying optogenetics was a lot of luck. These molecules out of the natural world, without modification for the most part, were fast enough, safe enough, and effective enough to mediate neural activity control. But the opposite was not so easy. How can we read out what a brain cell or other cell in the body is doing? Well, in this case, the natural world has not evolved molecules that are safe, effective, and fast. So in Erica Jung and Kirill Pjakovic from my group, we thought, if the natural world won't evolve these things, why don't we do it? You, you can take a gene, make millions of mutants, some are better and some are worse for any given goal, express them in cultured cells, and then screen them with a robotic microscope, scanning them and using a robotic arm to pick out the mutants that are better by sucking out the cells expressing those mutants. We did a directed evolution screen to make a fluorescent voltage indicator. In two rounds of directed evolution, we made 10 million mutants of a molecule called Quasar-2 from Adam Cohen's group at Harvard. This is a prototype voltage indicator that they developed. We then screened for molecules that were brighter, better localized to the, to the membrane of the cell, which is where the voltage is, and more stable. We made a molecule that we call Archon. It's expressed in the membrane. It has a high signal to noise. It's very photostable and it has good kinetics. Fusing it to a small peptide that locates it to the cell body, we collaborated with Shu Han's group at BU to show that we could image these molecules, excuse me, we could image these neurons and their voltage in the living, awake mammalian brain. The upper left shows the simple microscope we used. The traces in the middle look like electrode traces, but they're not. They are fluorescent traces that we're picking up on our microscope by shining red light and collecting the infrared light. So we can measure the neural activity of many cells at once in the awake 
mammalian brain. We're excited about this strategy because maybe we can use this technology to make lots of new indicators. After all, there are 30,000 genes in the genome. What if we could image all of their gene products and their functions? Now, we're not the first to try to make a fluorescent indicator. This is a screenshot from Jin Zhang's database. She tabulated hundreds of fluorescent indicators people have made by fusing fluorescent proteins, say from jellyfish and corals, to sensor domains. But those 30,000 gene products, they interact in networks. Ideally, you could see how a cell takes in inputs and generates outputs and all the signals in between. But how can you do that? The traditional answer says, well, make one indicator from a green protein, make one from a red, and then you can use them together. But it's hard to make these sensors. And what if you want to look at a bunch of proteins? What if you want to look at three or five or more? Well, we decided to try a different strategy. The basic idea here, explored by Shannon Johnson and Cheng Yang Lingu in my group, is to park different fluorescent indicators at different points in the cell. Some reporters are at the points labeled one and some at the points labeled two. The points labeled one, while the cell is alive, will blink out one set of signals, let's say for calcium, the points labeled two would blink out some other set of signals, say for protein kinase A. In theory, you could park as many indicators as, throughout the cell as you want. When the experiment is done, you can preserve the cell and look at the location of each signal. Some of the signals now you'll know, oh, that was actually signal one, because you can stain them with a stain. And some dots now you'll know report signal two, because you can stain them with a different stain. Here's one way to make it work. We can have fluorescent indicators, one and two, shown in the lower right. Each one is fused to a different self-assembling peptide set. That self-assembling peptide set will cluster them at random but stationary points throughout the cell. Then you can have an epitope. An epitope is a small molecule, like a peptide, that will bind to a label or stain, like an antibody. If every fluorescent indicator has a separate epitope, then you can stain them and identify which indicator is at each point. And you can do many rounds of the staining if you want. Stain, image, wash out the stain, and you can do that over and over and over again. Here's a cartoon made by the Ella Maru studio explaining the idea. The green dots are when the cell is alive. You get a, a movie of signaling. And the multicolored dots are after the cell is preserved and you can stain it potentially over many rounds of staining and imaging. Does it work? Well, panel B shows in a cultured neuron, GCAMP6, a fluorescent calcium indicator. Then panel C, we took that fluorescent calcium indicator and fused it to a pair of self-assembling peptides. You can see it forms clusters. We did lots of control experiments, looking at the kinetics and the amplitude and cell safety and cell physiology. And the list goes on and on and on. And we didn't see any alterations in the signaling or the cell health or the physiology by the clustering. Here we took three different fluorescent indicators and fused them into three different sets of self-assembling peptides. Green is the live cell image, and the false color images are the staining images. While the cell is alive, you can see these movies of activity. This allows us to derive relationships between the different signals. For example, in H, we have signals of calcium, cyclic AMP, and PKA from cells that have fast calcium responses to a cyclic AMP driving stimulus, the drug force clip. In panel I, we have some neurons that have a different calcium response. Panel H is slow calcium, panel I is fast calcium. We asked, calcium is sort of an input to this molecular network. What does the PKA output look like? In panel L, you can see the outcome. 
The cells with fast calcium had strong PKA outputs. The cells with slow calcium had weak PKA outputs. So we're able to drive the relationship between these. We can express these molecules in the living mouse brain. We cut acute slices to do better imaging. And we saw similar patterns. Neurons with fast calcium responses had stronger PKA outputs, and neurons with slow calcium responses had weaker PKA outputs. We can take four different indicators and use them together. Here we added a protein kinase C indicator. Green is a live cell image. The false color images are when we stain after the experiment is done. And you can see here that we can see four different signals at once. Or we can add a fifth indicator. Here we added an ERK kinase indicator as well. And now we can see five different signals in a living cell. So my hope is we can start to really map out not just the networks of neurons in the brain or throughout tumors or throughout organs, we can start to map out the molecules inside a cell and how they all interact. This is a very modular protein design. You can take off-the-shelf indicators and fuse them to these self-assailing peptides and they will go to different parts of a cell. So to summarize, we've been trying to do on purpose what the world had done for us accidentally in optogenetics. We want to evolve better indicators and find clever ways to use them together to understand how parts of a cell signal to each other. We also are starting to apply these tools. I mean, we give them out freely to literally thousands and thousands of scientists, but we also want to integrate them in our group with the hope of making computational models of the brain. Why can't we image all the signals, control them, and then make a molecular map? When the more Freifeld was a postdoc in our group, she found that we could expand the larval zebrafish brain, which has about 100,000 neurons. What if we could map the entire thing? When JU was in the group, we did something similar for C. elegans, showed that we could expand the worm, which has 302 neurons, and start to image it with nanoscale precision. And the live imaging, we've also been extending to these small organisms where we think we could image the whole thing. Erica and Kirill showed that we could do voltage imaging of the larval zebrafish. And we also showed something similar for the worm, C. elegans. So to summarize, we give all these tools away freely. You can visit our website, synthneuro.org, but we also want to integrate these tools so that we can try to understand and maybe even simulate brains in silico. Our hope is to really help bring biology and bioengineering to a level of ground truth where we know the fundamental building blocks of life and how they all work together. I've acknowledged along the way the people in the group who led these projects, but I want to acknowledge that this is a very interdisciplinary, even omnidisciplinary field. At the top are current group members and alumni over the years who led or helped with these projects. In the middle of the slide is an even longer list of people collaborators all over the world who we work with. Please visit our website, synthonero.org, to learn more, and email me at my email address, edboyden at mic.edu, if we can help in any way. We really want to help people solve important problems across the range of biological and medical questions. And with that, I'd love to have a discussion with you all about what you're interested in and how we can help. Thank you so much, Ed. That was absolutely fantastic. There was some like really serious science, but I think you explained it so well that like anyone could basically understand what you're talking about. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Um, essentially, we want to have a kind of Q and A discussion kind of session now. Um, I just want to tell everyone that it's going to be live streamed, recorded on YouTube. So if you're happy with that, then um, if you want to ask Ed your question directly. Uh, please use the raise hand function and I will come to you. Um, otherwise, please type your questions in the chat, either in the YouTube chat or in the Zoom chat, and I'll try and compile them um, and uh, ask them to Ed. So kind of to, to kick things off, I'll kick things off with my, my own question. Um, and so it seemed like, um, so what you were doing, you, you, you were developing a lot of tools. Um, so did you did you start off thinking about different tools you wanted to develop? Or did you start off thinking about the actual problems and then come to the tools from the problems? Always the problem. We think backwards in our group, not forwards. Backwards from the problem. 
Then we try to survey all the fields of science and engineering and figure out how to build the tool that solves the problem. Right, okay. And um, was, was the brain kind of the inspiration of your research or was it more of a consequence in the sense that did you go and say, okay, the brain is unsolved, I wanna solve it. Or was it more yeah. like, okay, I mean. Yeah, my first project was actually computational neuroscience. I wanted to make a model of the brain. But then we didn't have enough data. We couldn't test the model. So um, what I've been doing is uh, kind of taking a step back and saying, you know what, we need better data. But then to get the data, we need better tools. But I would like to evolve back into the computational neuroscience realm. My lifelong dream would be to be able to simulate a thought or a feeling in a computer and have it be biologically realistic and human understandable. Thanks. Yeah, that's really amazing, inspirational. Um, I think Anujan has a question, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Then. Thanks for that great talk, Ed. I've been following a lot of your work since high school, and I'm a PhD student here in Cambridge. Uh, so re related to your expansion microscopy work, um, I'm wondering, do you think we can positionally move um, specific cell types uh, in intact living biological tissue. And the reason why I ask that is it would be immense for a clinical application, specifically in surgery, if we wanted to model, remodel the microenvironments of certain clinical conditions, for example. And just wondering if you've ever thought about that problem of positionally moving cells uh, rather than just controlling them um, as, as the amazing work you've already done. Well, this is much more other people's expertise than mine, but Klaus Hahn's group has built a photoactivatable RAP1 and showed that they can get cells to follow a laser beam around. Uh, but yeah, this is not my area of expertise, but there's a whole community building such tools. Okay, wonderful. No, thank you. Great, yeah, wonderful question. Other questions? Chloe, do you wanna go ahead? Um, hi, Ed, thanks for a great talk. Um, I was just wondering, as you mentioned um, just at the end of your talk, that recent brain research has seen this increasing um, interdisciplinary type work. Um, and as an example, uh, complex problems like consciousness has been attempted by mathematicians and physicists, for example. Um, I was wondering, how do you see your kind of computational method of studying the brain fit in with the rest of these, these um, different approaches? Well, consciousness is tricky. We don't have a way to measure consciousness, for example. I might not be conscious, right? Maybe I'm just a very accurate robot and the real Ed is off on a beach somewhere, right? So I think that's the biggest problem is that we don't have an objective way to measure consciousness right now. Until that happens, I think it's very hard to really ground truth the science of consciousness. But my hope is that through our understanding of the brain, maybe we can help with that over a long time scale. Thanks. Um, and just kind of a quick related question. At the end there, you mentioned that um, kind of your dream is to synthesize the feeling of seeing uh, seeing something or an emotion in, in the computer. Um, that kind of just made me think of the common objection from um, you know, certain philosophers that the idea that qualia can never be objectively studied by science because you will not be able, because science is objective. Um, what do you think of that kind of argument or concern? Well, again, we don't have a measurement device right now that measures qualia or subjective experiences. So that's a valid concern, but I think these are concerns that can be addressed, right? Somehow our brain is measuring conscious experience, right? Suppose I see a green tree and I'm telling you that through my motor neurons and my tongue and my lips that I'm seeing a green tree. Somehow my brain measured my conscious state and now I'm reporting it to you, right? So I think it's possible. It's just that we don't quite know how to do it yet, right? That's an important point. I'm going to write that down. I just thought of that right now. <laughs> Our brain can measure consciousness. Hmm. Very interesting. Thank you so much. It seems like an interesting pursuit. Um, I think Flavia has a question. I can ask it for you if, if you don't want to um, ask it yourself. 
Yeah, no, sorry. I didn't realize that we could just ask like this. Oh, no, that's <laughs> um, fine. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. So my question, if I can, if I can phrase it in the same way now, um, was how do you think computational neuroscience and experimental neuroscience will merge in the future? Some people have suggested that we might have experiments streaming online into computational models to instruct those. Do you think that's a possibility? Well, that's already happened. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think neuroscience is reunifying. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you think you that will... You go first. Hmm? No, no, I was just going to say, I mean, how do you think, I, I, I know things like that already underway, but how do you think that will advance, um, I don't know, in the next five years? Well, the most important thing for a computational model, in addition to the computational model itself, is to have the right kind of data, right? If data is too crude, then the model will not be able to, to benefit from the data. And what's exciting to me now is this idea of getting down to the ground truth, the fundamental networks of the brain, the fundamental connections, the interactions of the molecules, those kinds of data are now becoming very possible. Got it, thank you. Thanks, Flavia. Um, I, had, I had another one of my own, uh, maybe a bit naive, but um, what's, what's currently limiting sort of reiterating um, expansion multiple times, like to get to like a really kind of big state? We've done that. You can, you can do the iterative expansion over and over again. We had an SFN poster, a Society for Neuroscience poster a couple of years ago where we did 100 fold linear expansion, 1 million fold volumetric expansion. So that works. Oh, that's, that. that's really cool. <laughs> and in the peer review that... papers, we've shown triple expansions that go up to 53x. So yeah, it is possible. Back to Anujan, if you have a question. Uh, so, uh, and a, a question related to controlling uh, circuit dynamics rather than mapping. In humans, I work with humans and patients. Um, DBS is is still the standard of clinical care for modulating circuits in vivo, and there's many many limitations as you've and others have pointed out. That is it. That is not as elegant as tools like optogenetics. So either we make our electrodes infinitely tiny to try to modulate specific circuits, or develop more. Uh, s s develop smarter uh, electrodes or other forms of technology to modulate cell type specific, projection specific, um, and in, in a temporally intelligent manner. I'm just wondering how do you how do you see the field in, in, in medicine evolving uh, to achieve some of the exquisite spatial temporal uh, manipulations possible in animals that are it feels light years away in humans. Well, I think the, the important thing is to use the technologies like optogenetics and expansion microscopy to do really great science. And then from the science, figure out the optimal strategy to help people. I'll give an example. Li Wei Sai, a professor at MIT, used optogenetics to discover that certain brain waves could help mice with Alzheimer's. Then though, to make it work well with humans, under her leadership, the teams went on to show that you could induce the same brain waves by having the mice watch a movie. And now we're doing clinical trials of movies with actual Alzheimer's patients. So precision might come from unexpected sources, which is more precise, a movie or optogenetics? Well, at least in the context of this one set of studies, they might actually have similar effects, which is sort of interesting. Thank you. Great, other questions? Um, Bram, do you wanna go ahead? Hi, uh, yes. Um, hi, Ed. Uh, thank you so much for your in really interesting talk. Um, actually, I found the uh, idea about expansion sequencing really um, in a way mind blowing in the sense that you could go to such high resolution for spatial transcriptomics. So I was wondering how does it compare with other techniques of spatial transcriptomics as well as a proteomics, which already exist um, currently. 
Well, the expansion gives you great spatial precision. And by the way, it helps other spatial transcriptomic technologies as well. Zhao Wei Zhuang, who invented Murfish, they use expansion to help them get higher yields, for example. So um, expansion kind of upgrades all of them in a way. Um, you mentioned proteomics. Did you have something in mind? I don't know of any, beyond like antibody staining, any good ways of doing in situ protein analysis. Uh, and as I mentioned in the talk, we're able to expand and do antibody labeling. But uh, I mean, there's, in in, there's imaging mass spectrometry as well as mass cytometry, but I guess it doesn't have that um, high enough multiplexing compared to sequencing. Because I think from mass cytometry, you can, you're limited to probably about 40 different antibodies compared to sequencing where you can literally probably sequence almost any transcript. Would there be a, probably a limitation for that? Well, transcripts are different from proteins, just to be very clear. If you want to do, you could, you know, in mass cytometry, uh, you know, you bring in an antibody with like a metal, if I recall, and then you mass spec it. But, you know, Peng Yan had a Nature Biotech paper in 2019, for example, where you can bring in antibodies with DNA barcodes, label a whole bunch of proteins, expand, and then do analysis of the DNA. So um, you might not need a, a specialized machine the way that these other methods do. Okay, that's a, that's a really interesting intersection between both, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ram. Um, yeah, just want to remind everyone, if you have more questions, please keep them coming in the chat. Um, Ed's here for another another 10 minutes or so. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, I will, I'll ask another one, I hope. Um, so you you said that you were, you were extremely lucky with like optogenetics and figuring it out initially. And um, so how, how important do you think that like these, these serendipitous discoveries still are in kind of discovering brand new kind of revolutionary things? Oh, so important, absolutely. I mean, CRISPR, of course, that was found in yogurt bacteria. Yeah, but I think you can try to be lucky by optimizing your knowledge and by collaborating and trying random things out. Yeah, thanks. Um, Bram, did you have another question? Uh, your hand is all raised. Oh, my bad. Um, I didn't lower my hand. Aaron? Hi, Ed. Thanks for your talk. It was like super cool. Um, I'm just, it's just a more general question, but I guess since a lot of us are like undergrads or like um, PhD students, do, would you have any advice for like, um, like, students who are early on in their like research journey and research career? Yeah, I mean, if early on, I, I would say very important to learn the fundamentals very solidly. Things like chemistry, things like computer science, things like physics. Um, I think of biology is built on top of these other fields. So it's very important to, to, to really know the, the underlying fields very solidly. That's what I, if it's at the undergrad level, that's usually the advice I give them. And now there are new majors like bioengineering, which um, many colleges have, which can give you that knowledge and the biology simultaneously. So there's a lot of, a lot of possibility nowadays. Cool, thanks. Um, Chloe? Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering, if you're interested in this kind of emergent phenomenon of the brain, um, how, how did you decide to kind of um, to which direction to approach it from, say, from computational neuroscience or from psychology or from um, mathematics. Um, There's so many ways to approach a very complex emergent problem. Um, and I was wondering if you have any insight on that and why perhaps you chose your field. Well, all the behaviors we study are informed by deep psychological thinking, of course. And then the neuroscience, we have to think of the circuits and the chemicals that make them up and the physical interactions. So I, I would like to think we haven't chosen a field, so to speak, as just trying to go for what's actually there. You know, Fields are human designed concepts, um, but the, the reality doesn't care what we call the field. But the, all that matters is do we confront reality at its own base value, I guess. I'm not sure I answered your question. Um, so like say the problem of consciousness, I guess you can study it from 
kind of the feeling of uh, experiencing it or uh, doing it from a kind of psychology, uh, using methods of psychology, or you can kind of look at the neuro circuits and the kind of um, chemicals that are being pumped. Um, and there are kind of different scales of looking at the problem. And I suppose in that way, um, you are in a way choosing which, which level you'd be viewing the problem at. I guess the question for, for you is what, at the end of the day, when you're finished your work, are you happy with what you've done? For me, I'm a physicist by training. I really want to understand things in terms of the fundamental building blocks. But if somebody's happy with a higher level description that ends without a fundamental explanation, that's totally fine. For me as a physicist, I want to know how everything boils down to the most fundamental interactions possible. It's really a battle of personal taste, I guess. Are you happy with your work? Hmm. Um, Chris? Go ahead. Yeah, hi, sorry. Um, I guess this is kind of a simple question, but someone mentioned DDS just now, and I'm like, I have no background in neurobiology, so I actually don't know what it's about. And um, yeah, I was wondering if you could explain that part. Yeah, it's just a, a wire that's implanted in the brain and connected to a computer stimulator. Mm -hmm. And if you stimulate a certain frequency, you can help people with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. Probably about 100,000 patients have had DBS implants. Does that mean like it re-coordinates the impulses for Alzheimer's patients or something too? I, to, be honest, sure nobody, to be honest, nobody fully understands how DBS works. Many people, hundreds of people are trying to understand that. Mm -hmm. So it's just like a technique found by chance, like how we, I don't know, just like trialed a lot of chemotherapy drugs and then we found like certain ones that work better. So DBS is also kind of like trial and error thing. If I recall, yeah, somebody's trying to lesion part of the brain to see if they can help a patient and they stimulated it and found that that helped too. Yeah, if I recall, it was accidental. I see, okay, thank you. That's how neuroscience has, tradi has traditionally made progress. <laughs> Serendipity and most of biology. So the question we ask is, can we make serendipity a deliberate thing? Do you have an answer for that? <laughs> What's that? Uh, no, I mean, it was just a quick present. Have you, have you kind of come up with an yeah. answer to that? Absolutely. Yeah, visit our website. Um, I co-authored two essays about how our group works. One's called Designing Tools for Assumption Proof Brain Mapping, which is how do you pick what to do? And the other one is called Architecting Discovery, which is how do you go about it? And that's kind of the, the most concise encapsulation of our group's philosophy. Well, that, that sounds really cool. Definitely check it out. Yeah. Um, well, in that case, uh, I'd like to, first of all, thank Ed for, for coming, for agreeing to talk to us and giving us this wonderful sort of snapshot of his um, amazing, like, breadth of work. So thank you, Ed. Um, I'd also like to thank um, everyone for joining. So the, the audience on YouTube, also on Zoom, um, thank you for coming. Um, and before we go, I just have a couple of plugs. So we have uh, a talk next week by Professor John Archibald. Um, he'll be talking about um, endosymbiosis and genomics. Um, and we'll put the link for that in the chat. So please do sign up and um, come to that. Um, but otherwise, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, thank you all. Have a great day. Stay in touch. Thanks. Bye bye.